Let me turn things over to Jason Kim, and we'll take the requisite legal steps to formally open our meetings. Uh, good morning. Um, I note that Elaine McCann, representing Budget Director Mary Beth Levate from the Division of Budget, is participating in the meeting via video conference from the New York State Division of Budget Conference Center at the Capitol Building, Room 131 in Albany. Uh, I will now ask for motions and seconds to call to order the May 14, 2015 meetings of the New York State Housing Finance Agency, the New York State Hous Affordable Housing Corporation, and the State of New York Mortgage Agency. Uh, may I have a motion for HFA and AHC? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, a motion and a second for Sonny May. So moved. So moved. Second. Um, as items are presented to each board throughout today's meetings, these motions and seconds will be used unless specific items call for a different vote or unless any board member or director wishes to record his or her vote differently. All right, let me turn things over to uh, President Towns for his presidential report. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be brief this morning because we have a lot on our agenda. Um, we have a lot of projects to consider this morning. Uh, earlier today, the Mortgage Insurance Committee approved insurance for 12 projects representing 4,063 units of affordable housing in six counties across New York State. And HFA this morning will be asked to approve financing of nine projects representing $623 million in new financing. Later, AHC um, <coughs> will be presenting a resolution to authorize funding in the amount of $7.4 million uh, representing assistance to 439 units of affordable housing. Um, yesterday uh, marked the uh, uh, the uh, conference for NYSAFA, the big industry event. Of course, staff was well represented, um, and we look forward to working with our partners uh, in this 2015-2016 uh, cycle uh, to, again, uh, work uh, to accomplish the governor's goals of creating affordable housing for New Yorkers across the state. Um, so with that, uh, we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, let me go to Jason now, report of committee actions. Uh, yes. The uh, Mortgage Insurance Committee took the following actions earlier today. Uh, the committee adopted the minutes of the April 9, 2015 meeting, recommended approval of 100% mortgage insurance for Webster Avenue supportive housing residents 411 East 178th Street in the Bronx, recommended approval of 100% mortgage insurance for St. Augustine Apartments, 1180 Fulton Avenue, Bronx County, approved 100% mortgage insurance for DePaul Trolley Station Apartments, 2464 County Road 28, Canandaiga, Ontario County, approved 100% mortgage insurance for Lake Ravine Apartments, 468-614 Lake Avenue, Rochester, Monroe County. Recommended approval of 50% mortgage insurance for Tremont Renaissance Apartments, 4218 Park Avenue, Bronx County. Recommended approval of 50% mortgage insurance for Lindsay Park, 30 Montrose Avenue, 2554 and 91 Borum Street, 31 Leonard Street, 67 Manhattan Avenue, 29 Moore Street, 202 Union Avenue, Brooklyn, Kings County. Recommended approval of 50% mortgage insurance for PRC Andrews Avenue, 955 East 163rd Street, 970 Kelly Street, and 1710 to 1730 Andrews Avenue, Bronx, Bronx County. Recommended approval of 100% mortgage insurance for 239 and 247 West 145th Street, 210-216 West 140th Street, 60 St. Nicholas Avenue, Manhattan, New York County. Approved 100% mortgage insurance for 261 West 116th Street, 201 West 144th Street, 234 Bradhurst Avenue, 377 Edgecombe Avenue, Manhattan, New York County, and 270 Rochester Avenue, Brooklyn, Kings County. Approved 100% mortgage insurance for Excelsior II Apartments, 120 to 126 West 169th Street, Bronx County. Approved 100% mortgage insurance for Jackson Crossing, 71 and 75 Jackson Street, Fishkill, Dutchess County. And approved 100% mortgage insurance for 2264 to 2274 Loring Place North, uh, Bronx, Bronx County. 
now present items shared by HFA, AHC, and SUNY May. Jason will record the approval of the minutes. The minutes of the meetings of HFA, AHC, and Sony May held on April 9, 2015 shall be deemed approved absent corrections from members and directors. Okay. Item two, presentation to discuss the agency's request for proposal for their business applications modernization project. Mr. Craig. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, members of the board. Yep. Okay, so the the purpose of this agenda item is to give you an update on our business applications modernization project to replace our legacy applications here at 641 Lex. Thank you. Okay. I'll say that again. The purpose of this agenda item is to give you an update of our business applications modernization project, also known as BAM. Um, to replace the majority of our business applications here at 41 Lex. I have a handout um, that you all have, I believe, right? Yep. Okay, we follow along on that. Elaine, you have oh. the handout? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so page two, the contents. Um, I'll cover the background, the Gartner study that was conducted, um, key objectives and benefits, the project plan overview, and current key milestones and, and next steps. Okay, page three, a bit of the background of the project. Um, so the majority of the business applications at 641 Lex have been developed in-house over the past decades in Foxboro, which is an outdated and unsupported technology uh, from Microsoft. These, these systems support our mission-critical applications spanning the following business functional areas, finance and accounting, bond administration, investment portfolio management, grants management, and property asset management. The lack of support from Microsoft and the shortage of Foxpro resources in the marketplace has created a situation at the agencies where we currently lack the system flexibility that's needed in order to properly support our core business needs. Okay, page four. A study with Gartner was conducted in 2014, and as you may know, Gartner provides objective analysis and recommendations on industry standards and best practices. Gardner's key objectives and findings, they assess our current technology and business process landscape. They identified opportunities for a common platform consolidation, for example, with ERP, enterprise resource planning software for finance and accounting. I'll talk more about that later. Um, they identified opportunities for business process consolidation, elimination of redundancies and manual processes, and they developed this strategy for and a roadmap uh, to plan the modernization of our critical systems. They also provide a high level current state of our application landscape and various solution <coughs> options for a future state. Okay, uh, page five. Don't, don't get frightened by this page, but um, this, this shows an overview of our business application landscape. So the key thing to focus on here um, are the, the boxes that are in red. Uh, and these are our major business risk applications. The ones with the, with the purple sidebar show the ones that are developed in Box Pro. So as you see, this spans a lot of our, or all of our business areas from Sony May, multifamily housing, affordable housing, finance and accounting, amongst others. So on the next page, page six, this is the future state. And you can see how all those numerous boxes or applications from the previous page are rolled up into a handful of application areas from grants management, property asset management, loans origination, servicing to single multifamily. And you can see how ERP is kind of sprinkled along many business areas. Um, and I'll talk more about that. So this, so you can see how this really consolidates um, what we have today. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, next page, page seven. So our key objectives and benefits. Objectives um, are to modernize the majority of the agency's business applications 
We want to replace these applications with mainly COTS, commercial off-the-shelf software solutions, which include ERP, enterprise resource planning software, such as SAP, Microsoft Dynamics, or PeopleSoft. Um, and we want to drastically limit the need for custom <coughs> software solutions. We have a lot of today. The key benefits will be to eliminate the dependence and obsolete and unsupported FoxPro software, implement industry standard practices, enhance flexibility, and increase reporting ability, provide real-time data between business functions, and reduce redundancies on manual procedures. Okay, next page, page eight. So here's a brief um, project plan overview. BAM is going to be a multi-year project due to the complexity and abundance of applications to replace. And because of the limited internal IT resources, it's going to issue an RFP to engage with vendors for software solutions, implementation services, and ongoing maintenance. And we're also looking to host this in the cloud. We've already drafted a version of the RFP, and we're using a lot of the input from the, the Gartner report. Um, for that. And to ensure that we have the level of IT legal expertise needed, we'll re engage with a law firm to assist us with the RFP. So they're also going to assist us with evaluating proposals as well as you know, writing and negotiating contracts. So they're already engaged with us um, and they're in the process of reviewing the RFP. They've already given us a draft uh, contract um, master agreement to, to look at. <coughs> So we evolve from now to the, the writing of the contracts. Okay, page nine. To break the project down into logical pieces because of the abundance of um, systems that we need to replace, the following phase approach will be followed to implement the required functionality. Uh, phase one, which is a, by far our main priority of focus right now, which is um, covers finance and accounting, bond administration, debt servicing, investment portfolio management, uh, loans origination and servicing, mortgage building for multifamily. Phase two incorporate grants management and property asset management. And I won't cover the other phases, but you can see what the other phases are here. Okay, and last page, page 10. This is uh, our current key milestones and next steps. So we spoke about the current uh, about the Gartner report, um, which was completed. Um, on number two, we've determined our procurement path, and we have done a lot of initial planning and analysis. We've had demos from SAP and Microsoft and, and PeopleSoft. <coughs> number four, uh, create RFP. We're looking to have that done by the end of this month. Number five, there's a lot of detailed analysis that we're doing right now to prep for the vendor engagement. Um, so we're working on that. So once the vendors come in, we can really hit the ground running with them. So we're using this time to, to prepare for that. And item six, um, we'll issue the RFP on June 1st. And then we enter the bid period and proposal submissions and uh, the uh, vendor interviews and uh, selection of the vendors and prepare the, the contracts and we're looking at that done by the middle of October. And 10 is a, a very key milestone. Uh, we'll come back to you, the board, to present our proposal and hopefully obtain approval to move forward at the October 15th meeting. And 11, to anticipate a date for execution of the contract, we're looking at the same day, if all goes well. Uh, and 12 will be uh, the vendor engagement begins for phase one, and that's a date that we need to agree on with the, with the vendors, coordinate with the vendors, uh, as well as with our business units, as it's our year end then. So we just need to get everybody coordinated so we can all be ready to start. And that's it. Um, so you can see there's, there's a lot that we need to do. There's a ton of work ahead. Um, but we're gaining the, the, the traction um, that we that we need. Any questions? I've got a few. Um, first thing, when you talk about 
obviously there's some consideration even before the RFP goes out and, and the answers come back. When you talk about a multi-year, uh, how long, what's the expectation level? Because there has to be some type of thought that went into <coughs> Yes, um, it's probably going to be uh, three or four years. Uh, Gartner gave us a roadmap um, that I covered about that. They, they went out a little bit longer. We think it, it, it's about that. It's about that time frame. Uh, the first phase, um, which is really the main and you know, the main phase that we really need to get in place, which is uh, getting the ERP, the SAP, or Microsoft Dynamics implemented, um, and getting all the, the financials and treasury functions into that. Uh, so that's the main effort. That, that's probably going to be a year and a half, you know, effort or so. Also, while you wait for you know the proposals, the RFP responses to come in, there is some type of thought as to what it costs before. What's the approximate? What's the thought process and how much? How much this should cost? It's millions. <laughs> that can be a lot or a little. Like yeah. two, or two hundred. Well, no. <laughs> um, a number of millions. Uh, we got numbers from. From Gardner, that were very high. We believe we think it's going to be you know, lower than what they what they gave us. Um, what was their know, what was their estimate but, uh, projection? Their their numbers were close to fifteen, you know, twenty million or so. Um, but the costing that we've got um, so far, or, or our analysis and research that we've done ourselves, um, it's it's less than that, uh, maybe half of that. You know. We, yeah. Assuming it's half of that, assuming yeah. it's seven and a half million, where does the money come from? We'll have to, uh, that's what we have to talk about. Um, this is, uh, th these systems have been developed, you know, back from back in you know, the late 80s, early 90s. I understand um, that these are antiquated yeah, systems. They're very antiquated. Uh, this should have been happening probably over the period of time, um, and this is going to be more of a big bang, you know, which is maybe in some ways unfortunate, um, but that's what we have. You know. So the, the blow would have been lessened if it was, uh, but yeah, that's that's where we're at, basically. To the chairman's point, that we probably need to do some cost analysis. Um, you know, we're spending an exorbitant amount of money in the patchwork system that we have, also. So. It shouldn't just be looking at what the conversion is, uh, because we're spending a lot trying to hold this thing together. So I think that there is a, a broader conversation needed than just uh, conversion will cost us X. Yeah. So we probably just need to look at that kid and work with uh, fiscal in order to uh, develop that um, uh, thought. Yeah, I think that would be it, helpful. It's kind justifying. Of like, understand these are antiquated systems that have to be redone, and they haven't been done in forever. And both the conversion as, as well as you know updating and, and, and new equipment, all of that has a cost. The only question is, at a certain point, realizing it is going to be a substantial cost, my question is, okay, we'll do an RFP, we'll hit, where does the money come from to be able to pay for it? And you know, where do we have to go to get that? Uh, or is it internal? So that question of where's the, the dollars for that, uh, you know, what are we looking towards a week if we're going to we're talking about executing a contract this year we need to be able to draw it down on that's a multi-year contract um, so that's just you know some of the questions and last but not least um, committee what is the internal committee or the committee that's comprised that's going to review the RFP and be able to make recommendations yes. who's, who's that committee who's on that committee yeah, so we, we, had, we identified an a initial committee. Um, so we'll have, obviously, people representing IT. Um, we'll have people representing uh, finance, Sheila's, Sheila's team, finance. Um, we'll have uh, Steve Chopi from, from Audit. Um, we are going to identify, uh, we have other candidates on a list of, to, to review from other business units. Um, Maybe from affordable housing, um, so or uh, Dan Murphy's area. So we talked about various people that can be on that committee to uh, to review the RP. Uh, the law firm will also then they're, they're not formal reviewers, but they'll assist you know with uh, looking at the RP. Yeah, the, the only suggestion there is, and I understand 
And I think we mentioned this the other day, um, just as far as we've got a law firm working with us, we should probably, you know, somebody who's not or an outside IT entity that isn't bidding or isn't, you know, isn't part of the RFP process, right. you may want to include them. Okay. When your committee also yeah. brings additional level of expertise to the table. Yeah. Um, and, and just one last comment. Um, you've got it slated for both presentation here and execution of contract on the 15th. I'm not sure I'd be that optimistic, so unless you get it to us well in advance, so we can see it as well as, um, I would just strongly suggest that, yeah, okay. you know, that you give us on the board a bit more lead time. If we get it a couple of days before, or a few days before, it's not getting done same day. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, uh, hello, this is Elaine. I do have a Hi. couple of uh, points to make, uh, particularly on uh, who else might be involved in the review. Has there been any uh, communication with the New York State Office of Information and Technology uh, Services? Um, at past meetings, we've discussed the fact that that agency is available to provide, be a resource for on any technology projects. We understand that there have been concerns in the past with merging your know, authority systems with uh, state systems. Um, however, the, that agency has offered to be a resource, and uh, I think in particular uh, with the review of the RFP, with the costing out of uh, the project, I think it would be a very useful resource for you to, uh, you know, access if, 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 if you have not already. Also, uh, on the purchase, the cuts. There, the state does a lot of uh, purchasing and has quite a bit of expertise with purchasing their systems and there might be some economies that could be achieved through uh, doing that through the state system. Um, so I would just add those two to the okay. chairman's comments. Great. Yes. Do you want me to comment on that? Sure. Yeah. So um, yes. we, we have, we've had conversations with, um, with, with ITS. Um, so. Um, <laughs> We, there are some uh, connection points to some systems um, with ITS, such as uh, SHARS um, and, and SAMUS. Uh, so we are coordinating with them uh, to make sure that we, we have the right um, collaboration uh, with, you know, with those systems. Um, and we, most of this work, or really 90, 95% of this work is really for 641 LEX here. Um, so we are going to, is most of this that we can do here our, ourselves and with the, with the vendors. Um, and we will engage you know, with ITSC. Uh, we, we did have some conversations with them, again, on, on some of the, the connection points. And we're gonna, we'll keep on having those conversations when they're ready to, to do that. Um, and then the other question was around, around issue of scale purchasing. Yeah, purchasing of scale. Just yes. potential for finding some economies of scale um, on existing. By by working with ITS on that on the purchasing of the cuts, for, since they per, make yeah. very large volume purchases. Yeah, what we're looking at the, um, the, the main. That you're going to be uh, buying. Yeah, I mean, the main systems that we're looking at um, SAP and. Microsoft Dynamics as well as PeopleSoft are on state contracts, um, so we know the costing of those of those systems. Um, the implementation services are not on state contract, which is a big reason why we need to issue um, the the RFP. Um, so, we, but we are in touch, you know, with um, ITS, and we've um, gotten you know some information from them, and uh, you know, so we're, we're taking in as much as we we can. Uh, from them, but the thinking is that we really need to we, we need to get this done and push it forward here. You know, and um, our focus is you know getting the work done. You know that we need to here. Okay. What? Excuse me. What other states? What other state systems will this have to interface with? Uh, so, like I mentioned before, Shars is one of the main systems that it interfaces with, and Shars handles um, the project tracking. Um, that interfaces with SAMIS, which does um, compliance and, and tax reporting. Um, and there's also um, the, for MWBE reporting, it 
interfaces with ESD, um, and they upload uh, information to that site or the MWD you know, compliance reporting um, goes goes there. Um, there's some connections with PIMS. Um, that's the personal information system. It's for tracking information on internal resources you know, people here. So there's, uh, there's, we have um, all the connection points um, mapped out. We've been diagramming out um, our, our landscape. Um, part of what you see you know, on, on page, page um, five here, and all the systems <laughs> with the dark blue sidebar are uh, state systems. SFS is another one, but we don't we don't directly interface with that. This is a high level overview. We have a, a low level diagram that shows you know, the real connection points in more detail. This is just for kind of illustration purposes. So um, I have three quick questions or comments. Um, first of all, this seems like really important and overdue project. Let us know how we can support this as a board. Um, when you come back to us in October, if you're going to do this financial analysis, one thing I think will be helpful for me um, is in some sense of what the internal resources we might need. Um, I was struck when you say that because of limited internal resources, you're going to be issuing the RFP, which is, I'm sure, the right way to go. Um, but, but it does raise a concern for me about whether or not we'll become too dependent on outside vendors and whether or not we will have sufficient capacity. And if we need to think about staffing as part of this, I mean, if it's a $10, 15000000 million project, and obviously it will be a long legacy system for us, we want to make sure we have enough capacity in-house so we're not overly dependent on outside vendors. I have an experience where I work at a university um, where we kind of outsource most of our IT, and generally that works pretty well, but we have some issues about who controls data and, and our ability to make adjustments because we get locked into market. So that, that's just one thing I would, I would suggest worth, that's worth looking at as we think about the plan. Um, and that may be there, but it wasn't high level of the uh, Yeah, I mean, that is, that is a, a concern and um, is a big reason why we're looking to outsource you know, as much of this. Um, but we still need a staff here. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're stretched, you know, as it is. Um, so we're looking to augment our staff, you know, a bit. Uh, but yeah, that is definitely a concern because we are pretty we are pretty thin. Um, so. um, and then the, the only other thing is just to, to keep an eye on both the legacy data as we transfer to new systems in case we need to <laughs> access older data, um, and whatever the plan is for that. And then, you know, the data control issues once you outsource, that can be a yeah, so we're going to, yeah, um, we, we will retain all the data that we need to retain. We'll talk with the various business units to see what the retention periods are uh, needed for, you know, the different uh, types of data that we have. Um, and as far as, you know, we do host this in the cloud, you know, we'll ensure that we have the proper um, security procedures in place. And that's another reason why we're working with this law firm to make sure that we have all those you know, the, the legal um, agreements in, the, in place, you know, for data security and us getting the proper, you know, access to the data, obviously, to our data, so we need to have access to it. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're fully aware of that. Other questions? Just one, one last question. In, in and, and while this isn't anywhere near the level of some of the larger tech projects, uh, IT projects that have been out there um, that have experienced problems over the years. At the, at the same point, we may also want to take a look at having an outside uh, firm or outside individual being able to monitor progress in the contract. Uh, it, it kind of is a safeguard and a protection. Uh, and, you know, at the very least, as I said, I know staff can do it on one level, but at the same point, somebody who does that for a living, uh, in the long run, yeah. uh, you know, as well as I'm sure we're going to build in the contract penalties for things being done on a late basis, uh, you know, by the outside firm. So we should, you know, at the same point, to make sure that they're being held to a timetable, uh, we may want to look to have an outside individual 
kind of monitor the contract over a period because it is a multi-year contract. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, uh, staff is never there forever. Uh, but you want to make sure that, don't take it the wrong way, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody exhale, take it easy. <laughs> Jeez. But at the very least, you'll, you'll have you know, an outside point of reference that'll be able to monitor over a regular basis. You might want to consider that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, to keep everybody honest. Yeah. Everybody's sitting on it. <laughs> Are you talking about me? No. <laughs> okay. okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Joyce? Um, when you issue the RFP, um, how will, where will the, who will that be issued to? How will that be issued? Who would be seeing it? How will you be publicizing it? Well, it gets um, issued on our, on our website. Um, so it's all you know, out there for the public um, to see through the normal channels. Um, and we were also directed, um, notify uh, via procurement. Um, they'll send out an email to vendors um, of interest to us um, so we can give them a heads up. Okay, RFPs out there, we can start um, bidding on it. And then there's a Q&A period. And we're going to have a, a pre-bid conference and bring, you know, bring the vendors in for any questions that they may have. And Joyce also, as with all RFPs, they're they're published in the in the state contract right. Re reporter. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering if there were any other special uh, venues or special ways of, uh, given the number of companies that are out there that do this kind of work. Yeah. Well, we're trying to limit. We're putting in minimum requirements, um, and we want to focus. You know the responders or limit the amount of responders so we want to make sure that they have experience with projects of this size um, working with the uh, ERP packages that we're interested in like SAP and Microsoft Dynamics um, uh, so we're putting in these requirements to kind of filter out you're getting right. you know millions of responses okay thank you, thank you. Yeah. We're going to move to the SUNY May action items. Please note, that, please note that items three through nine of the State Mortgage Agency agenda were discussed and voted on earlier at today's Mortgage Insurance Committee meeting. They are now up for vote, for vote by the State Mortgage Agency Board. There will be no discussion on these items unless the director so request. Let's move to the votes. Item three. Resolution approving 100% mortgage insurance on a $15,990,000 HFA permanent first mortgage loan for Webster, Webster Avenue supportive housing residents for 11 East 178th Street, Bronx, Bronx County. Jason. Okay. Uh, now before the Sunny May Board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment for the provision thereof for Webster Avenue supportive, supportive housing residents 411 East 178th Street, uh, Bronx, Bronx County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Sony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motions are carried and the resolutions adopted. Item four, resolution approving 100% mortgage insurance on a $12,910,000 HFA permanent first mortgage loan for St. Augustine Apartments, 1180 Fulton Avenue, Bronx, Bronx County. Next two, okay. the next two items on no. the agenda. Oh, no, no, we'll, we'll, here we'll go to that. Go ahead. Uh, now before the board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment for the provision thereof for St. Augustine Apartments, 1180 Fulton Avenue, Bronx, Bronx County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Sony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. The motions are carried and the resolutions adopted. Resolute five resolution approving fifty percent mortgage insurance on a thirty-four million nine hundred twenty thousand dollar HDC permanent first mortgage loan for Tremont Renaissance Apartments forty two fifteen Park Avenue Bronx County. Uh, now before the board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment for the provision thereof for Tremont Renaissance Apartments forty two fifteen Park Avenue. Bronx County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Stony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 
The motions are carried and the resolutions adopted. Item six, resolution approving 50% mortgage insurance on a $30,920,000 HDC permanent first mortgage loan for Lindsay Park, 30 Montrose <coughs> Avenue, 2554 and 91 Orem Street, 31 Leonard Street, 67 Manhattan Avenue, 29 Moore Street, 202 Union Avenue, Brooklyn, Kings County. Uh, now before the board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment for the provision thereof for Lindsay Park, 30 Montrose Avenue, 2554 and 91 Borum Street, 31 Leonard Street, 67 Manhattan Avenue, 29 Moore Street, and 202 Union Avenue uh, in Brooklyn, Kings County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Sony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Item seven, resolution. The motions are carried and the resolution adopted. Go ahead. <laughs> Item seven, resolution approving 50% mortgage insurance on an $18,890,000 HTC permanent first mortgage loan for PRC Andrews Avenue, 955 East 163rd Street, 97, 970 Kelly Street, and 1710 to 1730 Andrews Avenue, Bronx, Bronx County. Uh, now before the board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment uh, for the provision thereof for PRC Andrews Avenue, 955 East 163rd Street, 970 Kelly Street, and 1710 to 1730 Andrews Avenue uh, in the Bronx, Bronx County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Sony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. The motions are carried and the resolutions adopted. Item eight. Resolution approving 100% mortgage insurance on a $7,780,000 CPC permanent first mortgage loan for 239 and 247 West 145th Street, 210 to 216 West 140th Street, 60 St. Nicholas Avenue, Manhattan, New York County. Uh, now before the board for approval is a resolution of the State of New York Mortgage Agency approving mortgage insurance and a commitment for the provision thereof for 239 and 247 West 145th Street, 210 to 216 West 140th Street, 60 St. Nicholas Avenue, uh, Manhattan, New York County. Assuming the first and second previously entered for Sony May, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motions are carried and the resolution adopted. Item nine. Yep. This item has been withdrawn. Wait a minute. There being no further items for the SUNY May board, I'm going to ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the SUNY May meeting. Can I have a motion and a second to adjourn? Second. Okay. Um, Assuming the first and second previously entered for the Sony May Board, all in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. The motions are carried and the Sony May meeting is adjourned. Uh, our next board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 11, 2015 at 8.30 uh, a.m. Thank you very much to the Sony May Board members. At this point, I'll quote call to order the 45th Finance and Program Committee meeting of HFA, which will be held jointly with the board meeting. Can I have a motion to open the committee meeting? So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. We'll use these recorded votes as we move forward. Jason? Sure. Uh, the minutes of the 44th meeting of the HFA Finance and Program Committee held on April 9, 2015, shall be deemed approved absent corrections from the members. Item 10, resolutions authorizing financing approval in, the, in an amount not to exceed $276,300,000 for 222 East 44th Street, Apartments, Manhattan, New York County. Sorry. Oh, I was about to say Mary Racing through the door. Here we go. Uh, I was going to join. <laughs> perfectly, on, perfectly on time. Sorry. <laughs> morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, today we have a fairly indicative um, agenda of multifamily developments for the board to consider. It <coughs> includes upstate, downstate, preservation, MRT, 
Um, and new construction 8020s, um, starting with 222 East 44th Street, which is a 429 unit, 40-story um, tower to be built on 44th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. Will include 87 low-income units. Um, the building is participating in the city's inclusionary housing program, and therefore those low-income units will be low-income in perpetuity. Um, the bonds that are proposed to be issued are proposed to be issued in a floating rate mode, um, secured by Bank of China letter of credit. This for us is our third Bank of China transaction. We've seen um, a broadening of the investor base for these bonds and a very significant decrease in the rates on these bonds from our first deal um, to where we are now. Um, the building will also include ground floor retail. The borrower of this development is BLDG, 44 Developers LLC, um, which is an entity that's controlled by Lloyd Goldman, Katja Goldman, and Dorian Goldman. These for us um, are new participants in agency financing, but they're um, very experienced real estate um, owners and um, developers. They're part of a private multi-generational family real estate um, entity. And they control over 300 properties, um, most of which are in New York City and in excess of 20 million square feet of commercial properties throughout the US. ELD G is also proposed to be the property manager for the project, um, and we expect at this point that Common Ground or another entity um, similar to that will be administering the lease up of the affordable units. Noble Construction Group is serving as the GC, and the architect is Slice um, Architects. The total TDC of the project is about 332 million of which up to maximum of 276 million um, will be issued by the agency. It's expected 63 and a half million of which will be um, tax exempt and 187.7 million will be taxable. Questions? I got a couple questions. Sure. Um, one of the things I try to do when I look at uh, the board materials is to try to do a little bit of a comparison of some of the deals uh, that are before us. The, the first five deals have some commonality in that there's, well, there's three that are 80-20s, two that are 100% affordable. Um, try to look at the number of units, number of jobs, the uh, amount of tax exempt bonds per unit and the amount of the tax exempt bonds as it relates to the affordable unit in the case of the 820s. And the information seems to be kind of all over the place. And I was just wondering if you could give us, and I, I know this is not specific to this particular deal, but it really does relate to the next, to this deal and the next four, um, how, how, you, how we come to d deciding the amount of bonds that are allocated per project or, or per unit. Because some of the amounts, and this is an example, like this deal, the amount of bonds per unit is, tax exempt bonds is $730,000 per unit. Um, on, you know, the all affordable units. Yeah, it's gonna be considerably less. Considerably less. So, so, sure. so it's 179,000 a unit, which is a pretty wide. Did, could you just explain Step back and give us a little explanation as to mm -hmm. how how it works, how we get to the number, and it would just be helpful in evaluating okay. as a group. Um, we typically start from a budget and build upwards from there. Um, in an affordable transaction, we're going to be constrained many times by the amount of debt service that a project can carry. So a project can come in, the you know, development schedule is, let's call it $100. Um, we're typically generating tax credit equity, brings down the, that $100 in terms of what debt 
the project would need to carry to cover its development costs. Typically in a 4% deal, that's about a third of the capital stack. So let's say we're down to about $70. And then what we do is to <coughs> size it based on what the revenues are of the project to back in to what the debt amount is. You know, and when we size the debt amount on an affordable deal, we're thinking very much of what the mortgage insurance funds underwriting standards are because they're typically, though not always, um, the enhancer of the permanent debt on the project. And so there will be back, a lot of back and forth um, with the developer of, of the project um, to then size the rest of it in terms of do we need to <coughs> soft subsidies? Are they coming to us with a rent subsidy, which might get us in sometimes a higher income level? It's part of the reason why we've been so enamored of the RAD program, which lets us project base all those Section 8 vouchers. Yeah. So I think it's an analysis typically of total development costs, other resources that are coming to the table, and what is the debt amount that a project can handle. Right. And an 80-20, I'll stop. All right, go ahead. All right, anything to add to that? Well, on the all affordable deals, um, you know, during construction, we'll obviously have to be cognizant of the 50% test, and that often drives the need for a certain amount of bonds to generate the tax credits. On the permanent side, obviously, it's about right. cash flow and ability to service long-term debt. So, so let's talk about that, because that, that, I think, is that's another point. I mean, on um, these deals, I mean, if you're carving out the affordable units as a 20%. So now we're back so to the 80 20 Yeah, when I talk about okay. that, I'm really talking about the affordable deals. That's on the affordable deals. Right. 80 20s exactly. We're carving out the 20% of the units. Right. We're looking at the cost of those units and we're directing tax exempt bonds to that cost and using volume cap only to the point that we need it to hit the 50% test. So let's say if it costs $10, we know it doesn't cost $10, but if it costs $10 to build that 20%, that $10 for qualified costs, what we would do is probably look to give them five and a half dollars, perhaps, of volume cap to fund the 20%, so they hit the 50% test. Again, as um, Brett mentioned, it's critical um, on both sides, both the affordables and the 80-20s, in order to qualify for the maximum amount of tax credits. So the observation I guess I've made is that it seems to cost us, when I say cost us, we burn more tax exempt bonds on the 80-20s per unit than we do on the, but actually it does cost us more to build the affordable units in the 20 than it does to build <laughs> an all, all affordable. Typically. And, and is there a potential future policy conversation about how we're funding those, because in a sense it's, we're not going to use the bank for our buck as we would in the, in the all affordable. And, and in addition, it does look like the 10% to hit, to hit the 20% uh, or so in the, in the 80-20s, 20% 20 of the financing is with taxes and bonds, but 10% of that or 50% or of that, of that 20% would be enough to get to the to the 50% test, but in many cases, like in the first one, where 32 million would be. Uh, but we wouldn't use volume cap for this full amount. We I'm, don't differentiate in the board material at all with volume cap and what's recycled. But I think to your grand question is yes, there is opportunity for policy question, and I think that um, be a natural. Uh, segue to begin them after uh, the June fifteenth conversations. Yeah. So uh, there are going to be some new protocols, possibly, uh, and I think that that will lead to us developing, uh, uh, you know, new protocols in regard to how to move forward and uh, uh, deal with affordable housing uh, in in all kinds of, of, of settings. Yeah, that that's fine, and 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 it really was not a specific. Uh, Question is more of an observation in terms of how we how we size it and you know how, and the use of the scarce resources and so maybe we can we can defer it. But right, uh, I mean it had been the previous policy to put this a bit in perspective. 
um, for several years to only fund up to about a million and a half for low income units. So you'll see this change to 20% only. It's just a significant <coughs> cut right. that number down. But we welcome the policy discussion. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Uh, assuming the first and second previously entered for the finance and program committee, uh, all in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 The, the motion is carried and the resolution is adopted. Item 11, resolutions authorizing financing approval in the amount not to exceed $200 million to 7 West 21st Street, Flatiron, Manhattan, New York County. Um, we're before the board asking for approval to fund up to $200 million of tax exempt and taxable bonds for 7 West 21st Street, located on Street, um, between 5th and 6th Avenue. In Manhattan. Um, this financing will fund the construction of a 289 unit building, um, which will contain 58 units um, of affordable housing in two 18 story towers, one of which will face 21st Street, the other which will face 22nd Street. Um, the project, as in many of these, will contain four condo units. We typically see the lower income units condoed out um, to be a separate legal entity. The other three condo units will contain the market rate units um, and the retail and parking garage. Actually, this is two condo units. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Um, this financing will... Um, contain about 35 million of tax exempt bonds. That's both volume cap and recycling at about $603,000 per affordable units and 147 million of taxable bonds. The bonds are expected to be sold on a private placement to a consortium of banks um, to be led by Wells Fargo. The total development cost of this project is $283 million, which will also be covered by developer equity of about $90 million. The borrower for the transaction is William Friedland, um, who is a principal partip participant <coughs> in Friedland Properties. We've done several developers with Friedland Properties um, over the last several years. Um, the, I can't say the name of this, the Malar, Malar Strand, um, both of which are on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, the borrower entity also includes Richard <coughs> Chapman, who's the principal of the Chapman Group, um, also an entity that owns, operates, and invests in a variety of real estate um, and parking garage. Um, Rose, or another entity that's satisfactory to the agency, is anticipated to be the managing agent. Caldwell Wingate is expected to serve as the construction manager, and the architect for the development is Stephen Jacobs and Company. The development contains a number of green elements, um, a green roof on the 21st Street building, um, solar reflective, um, panels where there's not planting, um, windows that provide fresh air even when they're closed. This sounds like a pre-war building to me, but I'm sure that there's new um, fresh air tech even <laughs> when they're closed. New technology. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> just I had a house they just drift, like that. Yeah. Drift yeah. Totally had a house exactly. Yeah. I used to, it sounds like <laughs> war to me, but I'm sure. Um, LED fixtures, energy, um, star kitchens, and energy efficient heating and, and cooling systems. Um, I want to talk about the environmental um, report just to answer Nestor's questions ahead of time. <laughs> there was a phase one. You can uh -oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> a phase one prepared and a remedial investigation report. The site is an e-designated site, um, which means that prior to issuing the building permit, um, DOB needs to be um, furnished with the notice to proceed. That notice to proceed has been issued. And as we know from prior buildings in a similar situation, um, then at the end of the remediation process, the closure report um, is submitted both to us um, and the Office of Environmental <coughs> Remediation. Are there questions? Yeah, a number of questions. One is it's obvious that the green building features in this building exceed <coughs> what we usually see. Um, the concept of a green roof, etc. cetera. Um, what is it in this project that makes that feasible? That what, why is it not feasible ordinarily to do this kind of more extensive green building technology? Is there anything about this building, or is this just the initiative of the owner? I think it's the initiative of the owner. I don't know how much mechanicals are on other buildings and whether that would preclude a green roof, but we can have a further conversation and perhaps add that also to the policy discussion about encouraging people to install green roofs where they can go. Right, I mean, because I had been under the impression because I've raised this kind of issue regarding green technology a number of times. And my understanding was that we were going to, and do encourage developers to incorporate as much as possible. Um, but what I'm wondering is if there isn't some sort of standard that we could use or some sort of checklist of things that we could I think that's a great using. idea. Sure. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Let's come up with whatever that list is, and we can go through with the developer. Are you doing this? Are you not? What's the reason? I think it's a great idea to This is kind of implied right. in our other processes, the quap mm -hmm. and other things. Right. I mean, we do have standards. We do have minimum standards, minimum green standards. But the green roof is, as Joy says, sometimes there, sometimes not there. Would it be possible for you to send the board um, uh, uh, Donnie, any written criteria or procedures that uh, in regard to this? Sure. You know, I'm not an expert on green roofs. I, I wonder if the fact that this is an 18-story building as opposed to a 40-story building. No, no, I'm not either. I mean, <laughs> that's why. All right, let's figure it out together. But that's why I'd okay. like to know why is it feasible some places, why not, and what are the okay. savings that are associated with it also, if it's possible. Okay. I don't know if savings are available yet, yeah. um, but we're really curious about trying to track these things and capture them in our underwriting. All right, I mean, we should by this time have a substantial amount of data from the buildings that we've already approved. But they're not necessarily at the moment. Sorry? I mean, we know which buildings have incorporated which features, right? Yeah, we'll so. start to track them as they come online. The other question I have is related to follow up to Steve's question, which is really curious to me, because here we're seeing a much a considerably smaller project than the previous project. And um, the number of temporary jobs, which I assume are construction jobs, is substantially larger than that in the previous project. In this project, I think for um, 289 units, we're talking about 374 temporary jobs. The previous project was um, 400 and something units, but only 300 jobs. How are those numbers, the number of jobs, how is the projection of the number of jobs arrived at? Um, I ask him. I'm sorry? We ask the borrower. It's just the numbers that the borrower gives us. Yes. Um, that is something that is probably um, that we can track after the fact, during the construction period. Right, after the because fact that you know how many jobs actually were. Yes. Right, but I just find it very curious that 
as Steve pointed out, the number varies so widely. And in these particular, two particular cases juxtaposed, it's very dramatic. Um, and we have no idea why there would be such a difference. I don't know whether it's true on these, but often people report job numbers annualized, which for longer, larger projects that are a long period of construction, they may be reporting a number of jobs that's based on an annual number of people, right? So there could be, that could be one thing that's going on. It's how often jobs are reported. I mean, because frankly, in order for the data to be useful, I think we need to have some understanding of what it is that we're, what the data means, what we're looking at. Because otherwise, it's just, it's just a nice number to fill into a report, frankly. It's just <laughs> If you can't monitor, if you can't do a number of other things and compare, then they just made up numbers to be honest. Well, Harry? yeah. <laughs> and they could be giving us anything. We don't exactly. Know. As I said, they just put numbers on the page. They just made up numbers. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do we expect, oh, you know, did you want to answer that? I thought you were, I want to cut you off. Um, There's no way to answer that. No, that answer. I, 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 thought you, I thought I was going to cut her off. Um, so the direct purchase with Wells and the consortium, is that um, you do expect to have some savings there versus the traditional LOC route, or is that just? Well, the reason we're seeing people go that route is um, because of the Basel III reserve requirements, which okay. make letters of credit very expensive. very expensive. So some banks are still willing to write letters of credit. Um, but we're seeing increasingly, um, especially in the 80-20 world, people preferring to go direct purchase. They can take the, the bonds on their books. Sometimes they get preferential <coughs> treatment for them as a loan as opposed to a security. Security. They're earning tax-exempt income. It's in, in addition to Wells, do we have any idea how many different banks would be, would be participating, or is that still up? To be, to be determined. I think that there's um, three other banks, I mean two other banks at the table right now, and so we're going to sell the bonds in pieces to the three banks. The other savings that happens in a private placement like this is we're able to structure the bonds on a drawdown basis to match the construction period, which limits negative arbitrage okay. as opposed to a public sale, public sale. Where, where all the bonds are issued. So, Marion, could you speak into the microphone? Sure. Sorry. Do you need me to repeat that? Uh, the last point, yeah. So Chris had asked um, why private placement and were there any savings from private placement um, rather than a public <coughs> offering of credits. And I said in, in this instance, um, there's negative arbitrage savings because the bonds can be drawn down, drawn down during the construction period as opposed to all of the bonds being issued at once. We're also seeing the other thing that I had explained, we're seeing a sort of a disinclination, if that's even a word, um, of some money center banks to issue letters of credit because of the Basel III reserve requirements or letters of credit. Is that making a difference in the fees that they charge? Generally, no. <laughs> Let me clarify that. Um, I think if they were to issue letters of credit, we would see a higher fee level. I think um, now in private placements, it somewhat mimics the fees they would have charged prior to the, these changes. Other questions? Okay. Uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Uh, assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, the motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, 
All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution is adopted. Item 12, resolutions authorizing financing approval in an amount not to exceed $30,690,000 for the Webster Avenue support of residents 11 East 178th Street, Bronx County. Hi, good morning. Um, Um, so we're seeking approval for the new construction of 171 units of housing known as the Webster Avenue Supportive Housing Project. It's located in the Tremont section of the Bronx. All 170 revenue generating units will be affordable to households <coughs> under 60% of the area median income. This is one of our uh, MRT initiative projects and it's going to be providing a mixed, in, uh, mixed tenancy environment of supportive housing units. Um, 90 of the units are going to be available to the formerly homeless with serious mental illnesses um, and the remaining tenants will be uh, portable housing but not supportive units. We're seeking uh, approval for approximately 31 million of tax exempt bonds and an allocation of 2.1 million of low income housing credits. Uh, this project as well as the other MRT projects leverage uh, substantially. Uh, we will be seeking uh, later this morning an award of 5.58 million of MRT funds from the HTFC board. But there is also an award of 2.5 million from HHAP and a $10 million construction capital funding from OMH. OMH is also providing the debt service uh, on the permanent side of this property or of this project. Uh, that's a common form as you'll see in the other project for MRT and it really is what makes these projects um, work uh, on the permanent side. We also have a 9.7 million HPD supportive housing loan and a $190,000 federal home loan bank award. The project consists of the new construction of an eight-story and a 13-story uh, building. The services, which is a requirement of the Medicaid redesign uh, program, are going to be provided by Center for Community Services. Uh, the total co development cost is $61 million. Uh, the um, project team includes the developer owner of Common Ground, the investor will be Hudson, and insurance will be provided by uh, Sunny May. Have any questions? Just one quick question on the cash flow, the pro forma. Um, it says at the bottom that, that the debt coverage ratio doesn't include the OMH mortgage, which is something I would have normally say. I'm just wondering if you could help me understand that. OMH is providing debt service coverage on a portion of the mortgage loan. The rest of the mortgage loan is covered by the rents, largely on the one coming in. So and when so we do our underwriting, we take out the OMH part entirely? Right. Okay. Because that's a, that's a guaranteed, guaranteed payment. <laughs> doesn't need Subject to be covered by, <laughs> doesn't need to be covered by building yeah, Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to understand. That. Yeah. We, we don't see that always, but for us, it's a great feature. Kind of yeah, as I said, that's a real key to these projects. I mean, if you think about this number of units with our bonds and MRT uh, subsidy, it's uh, the accomplishment is as a result and permanent debt service. Really terrific project. Any other questions? Okay. So. Uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee, all in favor please signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, the motion is carried and the resolutions adopted um, with the recusal of Vice Chairman uh, Mr. Weiss. Item 13, resolutions authorizing financing approval in an amount not to exceed $26,960,000 for St. Augustine Apartments, 1180 Fulton Avenue, Bronx County. Hi, uh, this is another MRT uh, project. Um, we've seen finally the, the fruits of all that uh, funding that we made available last year and we're seeing quite a few MRT projects uh, come towards closing uh, in the first two quarters this year. So St. Augustine is located in the Bronx uh, and there will be 111 revenue, generation, re revenue generating units all available to households under 
60% of the area median income. Again, it's a mixed tenancy environment uh, with supportive housing units that will total 35 units for tenants with serious mental illness. Uh, we are asking for um, approval of approximately 27 million of fixed rate tax exempt bonds and an allocation of 1.7 million in low income housing tax credits. Again, there's a substantial uh, leverage to, these, to this project. Uh, we have already received approval for approximately six million of Medicaid redesign team funds through the HTFC board um, a couple months ago, I believe it was. Um, there's a 2.75 million um, capital construction funding from OMH, and again, OMH is providing debt service uh, in the amount of 8.7 million for this project. Um, there is also a seven million dollar loan from the City of New York HPD. So this project is a new construction of 12-story apartment building that will have a total of 117,000 square feet. It contains a real mix of bedroom sizes, 35 studios, 19 one-bedrooms, 36 two-bedrooms, and 21 three-bedroom units. As I mentioned, 35 units are available for uh, people with serious mental illness, and the services will be provided on site by Beacon of Hope. The total development cost here is $50 million. The project team consists of the sponsor, who's Catholic uh, Charities. Uh, the investor will be Richmond, and uh, mortgage insurance provided by Sunny May. Questions? No questions? Okay. Okay, uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution is adopted. Item 14, resolutions authorizing financing approval in an amount not to exceed $63,470,000 for 435 East 13th Street Apartments, Manhattan, New York County. Thank you. We're asking for approval to issue up to $63.47 million of bonds to finance the construction um, of two new towers um, on 13th and 14th Street, just east of 1st Avenue between 1st and Avenue A. This will be one seven-story building, one eight-story building, which will in total include 114 units, 23 million of which, I mean 23, 23 of which um, <laughs> are low income. Total development cost for the project is $93 million, of which, as we said, up to 63.47 um, will be financed by the agency of which we expect 17.9 million to be tax exempt and 39.8 million to be taxable. The remaining 35 million of development cost will be covered by borrower equity. The borrower um, in this instance um, is owned by two separate entities, MRG, which is controlled by William Stephen and Richard Mack. MBCP, which is the Benenson um, Partners Group, which is Bruce, Frederick, and Lawrence Benenson. Winthrop Management is expected to manage the building. The um, contractor, the GC, is Noble Construction Group. The architect is Slice. Um, in this instance, um, the there is a rooftop terrace um, on this building, landscape courtyard, and Energy Star appliances. The bonds are expected to be sold on a private placement um, basis and purchased in whole by Wells Fargo. <coughs> are there any questions? Any questions? Just going back to the question I had before um, on the private <coughs> placement, when we when staff selects the institution, how does that? We don't select. We don't. It, the way it, it works is, is very similar to how it works um, for a pri privately offered deal, okay. um, publicly offered deal, excuse me, or even on the affordable transactions where 
a borrower will come to the agency with their construction lender. Okay. And that actually is the role that the private purchaser is playing in this instance. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, so much like in a public offering, our gating issue um, for any of these projects is that we have a signed term sheet from either the letter of credit provider or from the private purchaser. Other questions? Okay. Uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolutions adopted. Item 15, resolutions authorizing financing approval in an amount <clears throat> not to exceed $8,200,000 to Paul Trolley Station Apartments, 2464 County Road 28, Town of Canandaigua, Ontario County. Hi, this is another MRT project. This one's notable though because it'll represent our notable for yet another reason, I guess all these all these are notable. That's but the, notable. <laughs> this is notable because it'll be the first project that we close as part of the MRT uh, program since we expanded it across the state outside of New York City. So um, it's it's and I think it's going to be a good example of of what we hope to accomplish with that expansion. So the DePaul Trolley Station apartments are going to be located in the town of Canandaigua. Um, all 48 units will be affordable to households earning less than 60% of AMI. Uh, 26 of the units will be set aside for single adults that suffer from psychiatric disabilities. We're asking for um, approval of uh, approximately $8.2 million of tax exempt bonds and an allocation of 441,000 uh, of tax, uh, low income housing tax credits. Um, this also uh, leverages uh, with our uh, partner agency, OMH, who will be making debt service payments, as well as a capital loan of $3.2 million. Uh, they're making a project development grant as well of $150,000. Uh, um, this is gonna be located and built on six, six acres of vacant land. It's located on County Road 28, and it's near um, uh, downtown Canandaigua. Uh, Route 32, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 332 provides a lot of access to retail. Um, I think another thing that's notable here is, you know, supportive housing at this location is also um, interesting in the Finger Lakes region as it's a, a fairly thriving town, right? Um, um, we are uh, proud to have um, um, supportive housing being located in, in an environment such as this. But uh, additionally, there's the Anthony Jordan Health Center very nearby, which provides comprehensive um, health care services. This will be uh, the new construction of one residential two-story building with about 50,000 square feet. The supportive housing services will also be provided by DePaul, who's also uh, the sponsor of the project. Um, the project team includes DePaul, as I mentioned. The investor will be First Sterling, and uh, mortgage insurance will be provided by uh, Sunny May. I think it's interesting for the affordable deals. I think we had a different investor for each one of the affordable deals we uh, provided uh, uh, today. Are there any uh, questions? Questions? And this will be the second of two great models of supportive housing in Canada because we last year, if I'm not mistaken, we did the uh, veterans housing on the VA campus. Yes, I, I'm. The, the name of the project is eluding me, but yeah, yeah um, Canada has become. Um, uh, really nice place for us to work in um, and there's actually market rate development that's occurring near the lake as well there's quite a bit going on and they've been active with the regional economic regional council as well okay uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee all in favor please signify by saying aye aye the motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution is adopted. Item 16, resolutions authorizing financing approval in an amount not to exceed 
$8,040,000 for Lake Ravine Apartments located at 468, 480 to 486, 568 to 576, 580 to 588, 594 to 604, 596 to 601, 606 to 614, and 609 Lake Avenue, Monroe County. <laughs> They're all right next door to each other. <laughs> um, anyway, this is a preservation project, a preservation example in our um, in our list today. Uh, financing for Lake Ravine Apartments. It's located in the city of Rochester on Lake Avenue. All the units are expected to be set aside for households with incomes below 60% of the area median income. We're asking for approval of approximately eight million of tax exempt bonds and an allocation of seven hundred and ninety one thousand uh, dollars subsidy loan from HFA, as well as a uh, allocation of four hundred and seventy seven thousand of low income housing tax credits. The leverage on this uh, um, project is substantial for a preservation project upstate. Um, we will be seeking approval for two point three million from the housing trust fund from the homes working families program, but in addition to that, they received a 600000 Better Home Loan Bank Award, and I think especially notable is a $950,000 subsidy loan from the City of Rochester. Um, the city had uh, put together a fund uh, a couple of years ago to help work with HCR to advance uh, a series of projects. We had uh, financed the Mills and Mickelson building, for example, uh, late last year, which was also supported by a substantial um, subsidy loan from the city of Rochester. Um, this involves the rehabilitation and preservation of the 101, 101 units. Um, all of these units have a HUD Section 8 HAP contract. Um, if you look at the photo of the building, you can see that it has a, a it's really beautiful architecturally. It has a substantial presence on, on Lake Avenue and is therefore good from a community development point of view. Uh, there are seven walk-up buildings and two surface parking lots. There's eight retail spaces currently. The retail market in this portion of the town is um, challenging. So that retail space will be converted to community service space as well as a community room and classrooms for adult education of residents that will bring services um, to the area and to the um, tenants um, better than probably what retail could be attracted at this location. The project also currently lacks green space for residents, and part of the parking lot is going to be improved to create a safe uh, play area. The total development cost here is $13 million. The developer is Baldwin. The investor is Raymond James, and insurance again for this is going to be provided by um, Sunny May. Are there any questions? I just have one question. The, the 791340 that uh, <coughs> Estimated HFA subsidy loan. What is the what is the balance in our subsidy loan? Um, what is the balance on our HFA subsidy fund? Um, we can get back to you with that information. What's that? I can get back to you with that information. You can get back to me. Yeah, I don't have it at my fingertips. Okay, thank you. <coughs> questions? Okay. Uh, now before the committee and board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the committee, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution is adopted. Item 17, a resolution authorizing the approval of the subsidy loan in amount not to exceed $1,162,660 to Shoyer House of Coney Island, Brooklyn, Kings County. Um, in 2013, um, Governor Cuomo passed the House New York Initiative, which um, facilitated the purchase by HFA of UDC's Michelama portfolio of 44 properties. Of those, we identified 35 that we intended to preserve over a five-year period. This coming June 5th will be our second anniversary. Um, and by that point, we will have closed on 16 of the 35 properties. 
making me breathe a little easier um, <laughs> at night or well underway. It wouldn't have, have been possible um, without Brett's help, without Roger Harry, many of the other members of our multifamily finance group, um, which have really, we've all rolled up our sleeves, dug in, um, and worked on these developments. Shoyer House um, is currently owned, as it always has been, um, by the Jewish Association of the Aged. We've done one other project with JASA. In this particular instance, JASA is undertaking a significant rehab of the project and recapitalization. Um, much to my disappointment, they decided to use conventional financing um, and are going through the 223F HUD program. Um, but that mortgage wouldn't let them cover all of the necessary repairs to the project. And so we've reached agreement, subject to board approval, um, that we would provide a subs subsidy loan of about $5,900 per unit or a million one sixty two to make sure that all of the work needed on the project would get done. Um, our money in particular um, is being directed to replace the two outdated passenger elevators, to replace the roof, um, and take care, care of some masonry um, work that also needs to be done, and installing a code compliant fire alarm system. Um, this work has been vetted by Cliff Archer, another one of our 18 members um, of the agency who's been focused on helping us get through the um, UDC portfolio. Are there any questions? I'm just curious, <clears throat> noticing the proximity of this building to the beach in Coney Island, um, was this building affected by Hurricane Sandy? It was affected by Hurricane Sandy. We had been in touch with JASA um, through that period of time. Yeah, I know I need to do the last next thing. I'm sorry, <laughs> don't let me forget. I'm sorry, that's one thing that I didn't mention to the board. Um, we had been in touch with them. They had collected on their insurance and they were able to do. So all of the necessary repairs were done with that? Exactly. Uh, uh, okay. Um, and you'll see that in their mortgage loan, there is some flood protection um, work that's also <laughs> being done. What I had neglected um, to mention to the board um, is with regard to the Lex Nex. Um, and we had said in the um, board memo that we would report to the board, and there was one finding um, that we did see on the Lex Nex, and that is that the Elevator consulting firm has an outstanding city lien. Usually we get quite serious when it's a state lien, but this is a city lien in the amount of $23,467. 23, a little bit of difference. Okay. Just a little different. So 23467 outstanding city tax lien. We have been in touch. Staff has been in touch um, with vertical systems analysis, um, and they say they know that they owe the money and they will take care of it. And if they don't take care of it before we close, we, what we typically do is then hold the money out of the budget to assure it's being paid. I'm sure the city appreciates that. I want to find her space. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, now before the board is a resolution of the New York State Housing Finance Agency authorizing the making of a subsidy loan for the project known as uh, Shure House of Coney Island. Um, assuming the first and second previously entered for the board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Item 18. Resolutions authorizing a $520 million unrated private placement financing for the Gotham West Project, City of New York, New York County. Um, we're before the board with what I've um, typically unprofessionally called a plumbing change to the underlying bond documents um, of Gotham West in 2011. The board approved um, the agency's ability to issue up to $520 million of financing for Gotham West at 
1238 unit development on the far west side between 44th and 45th Street. Um, and between 10th and 11th Avenue, that building is now complete and nearly fully occupied and is moving from its construction phase financing, which was letter credit, um, fronted by Wells with, I think, 20 other lenders as part of the lending group, um, and is now moving to permanent financing phase. And we need to tweak the under, amend and restate, I think is probably a better way of saying, amend and restate the underlying bond documents to allow for um, a 15-year direct purchase of these bonds. I do want to note um, that although the board approved up to 520 million of bonds, this transaction was funded on a multi-year basis. And because that number was so large, um, this is something that we do anyway. In a multi-year, we were um, very rigorous at testing and confirming that the borrower actually needed that amount of bonds as we came up to each year's issuance, and we ended up um, only issuing 480 million of bonds. Um, so that 480 million will stay outstanding. Um, this will facilitate a 15-year direct purchase, which is expected to be structured um, on a floating rate basis, both tax exempt and taxable, plus a spread. It may include um, a fixed rate component um, as well, and these bonds are expected to be purchased by Wells Fargo. Um, and much like two transactions that we did last year, um, Although it's not part of our documents, um, I do want the agency to know the bonds are going to be deposited into a custodial account. There will be a Freddie credit enhancement facility also deposited into that custodial account. And then custodial receipts will be reissued back to Wells, and that's what Wells will hold on its books. Are there any questions? Um, now before the board are resolutions to be adopted that were transmitted in connection with this item. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor please signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion is carried and the resolutions adopted. Item 19, <coughs> resolution authorizing the subsidy loan for Indian Trails Apartments, Malone, Franklin County, an amount not to exceed $9 million. Hi, this is seeking approval for another one of our uh, ED, ED, ESDC um, home house, excuse me, that, House New York, <laughs> tripping over the acronym, House New York ESD portfolio uh, for which we are uh, very much focused as, uh, as Marion suggested. Um, this um, is moving forward a, a, a bit from a different model from the other House New York projects, although we have done um, a couple projects in this manner. Um, especially in rural areas and some upstate communities, we're not able to move these projects forward using a tax exempt bond and 4% low income housing credit transaction. And, and some of the projects have been pursuing funding through our unified funding application uh, to benefit from the 9% low income housing credits. This past year, we made the HFA uh, Mitchell Lama subsidy associated with this portfolio available through our unified funding application so that borrowers could apply for both 9% credits as well as the subsidy source simultaneously. Earlier this week, um, we announced, uh, the governor announced awards of the 9% tax credits. Um, actually, that was Tuesday, I believe. Uh, but the project is also uh, requiring approval from HFA for the subsidy source through that uh, program or through our program. So this project includes the rehabilitation of a 128 unit project in Malone, New York, in Franklin County. Um, we're seeking uh, approval for a $9 million house New York subsidy loan. Uh, we are leveraging a $3 million permanent loan from the Community Preservation Corporation. Bank of America is also participating in this project through their subordinate loan program uh, to the tune of $1 million. And H, um, DHCR has allocated 569000 of 9% loan housing tax credits. This project uh, is a 26 two-story buildings containing 128 units. 
There's 38 one bedrooms, 65 two bedrooms, and 25 three bedroom units. It's the largest affordable house family housing project in the North Country. The project is in serious, very serious need of repair. It'll be able to replace, uh, for example, if you want some uh, comparisons to housing available in the North Country to what we previously have provided. Currently, um, this uh, project is utilizing propane tanks and electric space heaters uh, on the site and will be connecting to natural gas in lieu of that. So you can imagine um, the needs for repairs. The project team includes uh, Wynn. Uh, Wynn will be uh, moving the project uh, forward in partnership with our colleagues. Awesome. Are there any questions? Um, I, I don't have any questions. I guess it um, looks like a great project. Just as a follow-up to my question before about the balance and the subsidy fund, I think it would be helpful for the board to see um, not only the balance, but also you know, how much these projects represent in terms of the amount we have left to allocate. Maybe that can be a subsequent report that could be circulated in advance in the next. Uh, sure. I mean, this is part of um, the budget cycle, the Mitchellama funds. This Correct. year we have 42 million um, allocated to spend, but you're by your accountant. It would just be good to know how much we have left to allocate. <laughs> right. I mean, it is definitely something that we monitor, of course, and as we project what we're going to um, be able to dig into this year, it's something that we pay close attention to. Yeah. You're speaking generally or as now as New York? Well, I, I guess I'm speaking generally about the, the um, HFA subsidy fund, but but also as it relates to the amounts that we have within the budget to allocate, just to know what's left <coughs> and how much each of these represents in terms of percentage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, now before the board is a resolution of the New York State Housing Finance Agency authorizing a House New York project subsidy loan for the project known as Indian Trails Apartments. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is carried and the resolution adopted. Okay, we now move to the AHC consent item. Item 20, resolution authorizing award of grant funds to certain projects located inside and outside the city of New York. Okay, uh, this is a consent item. There will be no discussion unless board members so request. Um, so now before the board is a resolution of the New York State Affordable Housing Corporation authorizing awards of grant funds for certain projects located inside and outside of the city of New York. Um, assuming the first and second previously entered for the AHC board, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. aye. Uh, the motion is carried and the resolution adopted. There is no further items for HFA Finance and Program Committee and the HFA. One second. I'm sorry. Oh, do, you, sorry. do you mind if I update the board on Not Ennis Francis? Oh. Um, Ennis Francis, Francis from, was the project uh, that we had, we had discussed mm -hmm. last, last board meeting. Um, there was incredible efforts on both legs um, of either getting the um, TCO or extending the bonds, and um, the bond piece actually was able to be completed. It was, in my 30 plus years of being in the muni bond business, I have never done anything that was sort of as hard, as challenging, as um, technically confusing for some of us um, to make happen, but we were able to get um, bondholder consent for an amount that was necessary to extend the maturity of those bonds to allow the borrower significant time to obtain their TCO so that they can qualify for the maximum amount of tax credits. Um, that closed on April 29th the day before it needed to close. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the 30th, the day before it needed to close on May 1st. It was an extraordinary effort. Um, I want to give a shout out to Gloria Boyd, who was big help. 
it's all a blur. Who else helped me do that? It was enormous. Um, it got done. And um, I want to thank the board for your support of our efforts to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, and well done. Thank you. There being no further items for HFA Finance and Program Committee and the HFA and AHC boards, I'm going to ask for motions and seconds to adjourn the meetings. Second. Second. Okay. Um, assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA Finance and Program Committee, uh, all in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, the motions are carried and the committee meeting is adjourned. Assuming the first and second previously entered for the HFA and AHC boards, all in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, the motions are carried and the meetings are adjourned. Um, our next board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 11, 2015 at 8.30 a.m. Thank you.